Meet Christopher R. Mim, a writer, director, and producer of The Mimiverse, a series of feature-length films that pay homage to 1950s drive-in cinema. Since 2006, Mim has turned out a film almost every year, creating a vast catalog of movies and a cult following to boot. Welcome to Scratch Claw Push, a podcast about artists clawing out a place for themselves in the world. I'm Billy Joe Combs. And I'm Brandon Duke. Let's go. So welcome to the show, Mr. Christopher R. Mim. Hi. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so right at we uh this is a, a ritual we like to do at the uh start of the show. It's uh thanks to uh Miss Billy Joe Cones, who is getting the timer ready. We call it the 60 second intro. So what we're going to have you do at the outset is Billy's going to start the clock and you've got 60 seconds to give us your, uh, your verbal regiment resume, the one pager, not the whole CV, just, just kind of intro, like who you are, what you do. Elevator pitch. Elevator pitch. Got it. Exactly. All right, Billy. Yep. I'm ready and go. Hi, I'm Christopher R. Mim. I'm the writer and director of the films of the Mimiverse, which pay homage to the 1950s drive-in cinema. So I make basically new, old, good, bad 1950s style monster movies. And to date, I've made 18 of them. I'm working on number 19. And you can find more about me at SaintEuphoria.com. That's all spelled out. If you can't remember that, go to TheGiantSpider.com. How'd I do? Wow. I mean... You like 30 seconds? Boom. I mean, you have 30 seconds left if you want me to start. You can tell us yeah, he's, he's a, he, he might have just raised the bar. He got it down to 30. So, I mean, I've done that before. Like, like that, that elevator pitch on, on other things. It's like you get it down to, I mean, I've been doing this now since 2005. Like, you get it down to just like you have 10 seconds to sell someone on this, tell them what you do. And it's like, I make cheesy movies. Boom. I mean, that's it. That's all it is. Um, so, like, so what? 18, uh, go ahead, Billy. Go kick it. 18, 18 movies. Yep. 18. So, yes. Yeah, so, what the people really want to know, Christopher, is how how does one? So, how many years did it take you to produce eighteen movies, and how does one produce eighteen feature films in that many years? It's taken me eighteen years to make eighteen features. Plus, I did. Um, I also did a Christmas special a couple of years ago, uh, but. Honestly, um, I don't want to say COVID helped, but that gave me more time to finish it just because there was less going on because uh, I used to do lots and lots of events and I was always traveling and stuff. And then COVID kind of brought that to an end and I was able to just spend time with my family and we made a Christmas special uh, that works with all my movies. And I also did um, for the 10th anniversary of my first movie, I helped a couple of folks do a uh, musical theater version of my first movie. Uh, which was pretty cool. But so, I don't know. I just, I started back in 2005. I really wanted to make a movie for a long time. We were talking a little before we started recording here about how I used to be in bands and stuff. And as I started getting older and having kids, uh, it started being harder to be sort of in a rock band. But um, I just, you know, you got to be a little cool to do that. And I, I just wasn't. So I wanted to find something else. So I started making this idea of making this cheesy movie called the monster phantom lake um and i don't know i just kind of got inspired to do it and i'd been wanting to do it for a long time and so i just started writing it and got together with friends and we held auditions and suddenly we filmed a movie and suddenly i put it out and i made a movie and um you know just kind of became inspired to want to make more and then it just became a thing uh every year i'd sort of refine the process to be you know, more and more streamlined of how much time I need to write a script, to do the pre-production, to start shooting, to work around people's schedules. I just, I basically worked out a process that allows me to put out a movie a year um, while at the same time doing uh, side work, doing, a, I'm a programmer as well uh, for doing like a contract work on the side. But then also I have, you know, I'm married and I have uh, six kids and like a granddaughter now. I mean, it's just like, I'm very busy, but I was telling you before, we started all what really helps is that I turned my movies into like a partridge family thing, right? All my kids and my wife and we're all involved in this because I mean, they've all, my kids have all grown up with it at this point, you know? Um, 
like when I put out the first one, my, um, you know, my three, you know, youngest kids weren't even born yet. So, I mean, it's, it's, some of them have just, they've grown up with it. It's part of their life. It's their weird story. And I keep telling them that at some point they're going to be excited because they're going to go off to college and all their friends are going to tell sort of like similar stories. And then my kids are like, well, let me tell you this story about this one time. We were uh, went to a drive-in in Ohio, and these random people let us stay at their drive-in, and it was the craziest. I mean, weird stories like that that will be unique compared to most people. But that's that's how I more or less made it work. Um, and then just sort of trying to take on as many roles as I can uh, in the process, I think, helps because then I can sort of control each step. And then I know, like I said, I need about a month to maybe – a couple weeks to a month to write a script and then this much time. And I got people that consistently come in and help like Mitch Gonzalez, you know, Mitch, you've met Mitch. He makes all the monsters for us. He does really great work. And he and I have a process where it's like, I come up with an idea and I start writing a script and I'll send I'll, I'll be like, Hey Mitch, here's what we're doing next. And he's like, tell me. And then immediately, <laughs> usually within five hours, he's sending me sketches for stuff. So, I mean, it's like this constant back and forth of like having people that help and that I know can step up and everyone does their little part uh, just to sort of keep this going um, year after year. Um, I don't know how long I can keep it going, but so far I've got 18. I'm working on 19. And um, one of my sons said the other day, he's like, look, you can't quit at 19. You know, you have to go to 20. There's no sense in quitting at 19 it's like being running a marathon and you see the you know the, the finish line you're like hey, i'm going home you know it's like I, I i guess but you know i as long as i'm able it's it's what i do it's fun so that's a long answer for what you asked but <laughs> yeah so like <laughs> what how long did it take you to refine that process like i guess at what like, were you on like what second, third, fourth movie by the time you kind of, I guess, got like got it into like the factory settings? Well, I think like the first one was funny because it it really did feel like it was completely, um, you know, uh, seat of our pants. Everything we did felt like, uh, and I remember each time we'd like reach a milestone, it was always this moment of like, holy crap, we just did this thing. You know, it was like, oh, I wrote a script. I finished a script. Oh, my God. Oh, we did auditions. What? What? Oh, my God, we're filming. You know, it's like each point. And then suddenly it was like, I have a finished film. But what do I do now? Um, I think it probably took, I don't know, three or four, maybe even five movies before I really got it down to noticing the patterns and how long things took, but then also figuring out ways just by sheer repetition of how to streamline certain processes or, or, you know, um, one of the things I do that I think really helps is that because I'm making such low budget films, um, and Billy Joe, you've been in one or two of them, you know how this goes. Uh, I usually try to work around, uh, people's schedules, right? So it's like, I want to try and make everything as, as painless for everyone as possible. I would, I mean, I would love to actually see what it's like to be just like, we're filming for two weeks. Everybody be there. I've never done that. It's always like, well, when are you guys available? Oh, so you're all available Tuesday. Let's shoot. Uh, but because I edit my films at the same time, it ends up making it so like, well, shoot on Tuesday. Well, then I can edit that scene right, right then and there. And if I need stuff later, we can get it some other time. So the process ends up being very like organic of just like flowing from one to the next. And I'm always happy, like when I reach the end of principal photography and it's like, OK, at this point, all I have to do is edit it. And then I should, in theory, have a movie to release, uh, however good or bad it is. It is what it is. And you just kind of keep moving forward on it. Um, I don't know. I'd say, yeah, four or five films by the time it really got to, like you said, the factory settings of just like, OK, I need this much time. I need this much time. I need to do this. I need to do this. Um, scheduling is always the hardest part. but. Um, that's what people have lives and, you know, a, a pandemic happened once. So like I had to change things up and flexibility, you know, that's important. Um, you know, like this, we, we tried to get this going for uh, a week and it was just like, well, crap happens. Well, okay, we'll make it, we'll make it work. You know, it's that sort of attitude of trying to not get too wrapped up and okay. It didn't work this time. Doesn't mean it's not going to work. I, I see that. I see other, uh, 
filmmakers and stuff they do that where it's just like they give up too too easily or they they they're not flexible enough or they're I don't know where it's I've seen so many people because I'm friends with a lot of people uh, who've done a lot of different levels of film and I, I see more people sort of give up than not sometimes and it's a hard it's hard to do especially from beginning to end it's such a long process I mean you have to look uh, you know really um, I'm long term at these things because I I know that I, I I need a year to make a movie right um, to really do the whole process from beginning to end I need a year uh, and it's hard when you're mired in month month four and something's not coming together or you can't get a certain day or whatever to shoot sometimes it gets hard mentally to just be like why am I still doing this or still you know, eight months to go, ah, and it becomes overwhelming. And I see some people sort of give up at that point. It's it always makes me sad. It's like just just fight through it. You can do it. You can do it. And once you get there, it's totally worth it. But it's weird because you spend so much time, so many hours, so many man hours of of doing something, and then you have like I like I just did a premiere last week or two weeks ago, and like you're sitting in that theater, and an hour and a half goes by, and it's like, well, that was it. What's what now? And you just have to keep sort of looking forward on that it's like well we move into the next one let's go i want to ask though so when was there any one of your films that was the hardest to make or that made you feel like giving up uh well there's i guess there's probably two examples um i made this movie called guns of the apocalypse right that was uh it's my i called it my um spaghetti midwestern it's like a western but it's also a post apocalyptic story and it's you know supposed to be patterned on spaghetti westerns but still have sort of a sci-fi bent to it um and that was one of the hardest movies to shoot partially my own fault because i <laughs> So I've grown up and lived in Minnesota my entire life, and I know what our winters are like. And I'm like, I'm going to make a, a Midwestern that takes place in winter, and I'm going to shoot a bunch of stuff outside in the winter, in February and March. And that was grueling. Just the the day shooting on those cold, snowy, windy days, that was tough. There were times where I'm just like, I, 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 I couldn't believe like I had so much trouble with just how it was just so hard to get... I mean, and, and I was probably the biggest whiner the whole time. Like, the actors are like, we're fine. Let's do this. And I'm like, oh, this is terrible. And I kept having, like, there's weird really... things. What, say again? I was going to say, there's a reason Hollywood fakes this shit. I mean, seriously. <laughs> um, there were, And it's funny. I kept having things where, like, I kept trying to to do what I could to fight the cold. Like, I bought, like, this, this pair of boots just at at uh, goodwill that were really nice and really warm and i'm like all right now i'm comfortable the first day i wear them on set i take a weird step and it pulls the toe off of one of them and i'm like i can't win this is the worst but um i feel like all that hard work and all that sort of suffering which sounds really dramatic but i make movies so what can you do um all that really sort of pays off i think in the final product i think the final movie is um technically one of my best um it's kind of polarizing amongst the the fan base just because it is very different uh, and it's a little heavier it's a little more serious it looks different than anything i've made but i don't know it's a little weird uh but i'm super proud of that movie partially because it was like an ordeal you know we, we all fought through it and we made it so that was one of the hardest ones to do the other one was um I, I ended up having to actually shut one down because of the pandemic, which up till that point, um, I never started shooting a movie and then had to stop and cancel it. Like I never had done that for years and years. Um, like uh, I had one that like came close, but then we never were able to get it scheduled. And I, I ended up sort of abandoning it before I actually started shooting it. And that was that was much better than actually like shooting a third of the dang thing and then having to stop. Um, and that one was just problematic sort of not, you know, from the beginning of, of, I was supposed to shoot it in 2018. Um, and then like, we couldn't get it scheduled. So I ended up actually making Guns of the Apocalypse. So that worked out. And then, um, like 2019 got all kind of messed up and then 
Finally, in 2020, we got it going and we, we shot about a third of it. And then I remember like while we were shooting it, there'd be like, you heard of this COVID thing? Yeah, it's it's never going to be a problem here. It's in some other country. Don't worry about it. And then, of course, everything went to hell. So I shot about a third of it and I ended up having to shut it down, which I'd never had to do. But up till that point, because it just kept dragging on. Right. And I realized that at this point. By the time I'd get back to it, like some of the actors had moved out of state, um, like a couple of them just didn't look the same. I mean, it just it I would have to start over. So, yeah, I just had to shut that one down. And um, that that sucked. I mean, it was just that's that's the first time I had to do that. And, you know, um, you know, 18 years that it was just it was really made me sad to have to do it. But on a weird note, and this is. You know, it's cool that I'm talking to you guys now is that so that became kind of the lost movie, right? It's like we shot parts of it. We never got finished and it got canceled. Um, I was approached by a, um, a guy who writes um, he writes books, but also has written a few scripts for like sci fi channel movies like monster movies. Uh, and he contacted me and just said, you know, I like your movies. And I was wondering would you ever be interested in letting me do like a, a novelization of your script since it'll never really get released? Um, and I was like, yes, absolutely. And uh, I was just talking to him last night. Um, you know, the novelization is finished of the script. Uh, I, I, I love sort of what he did with it, but what, you know, it keeps the essence of the script, but then also he adds some stuff to fill in the blanks just cause changing from a movie to a written word, you got to do certain things. Uh, and now we're just at the sort of proofreading stage and I'm hoping we'll have that, you know, ready in a couple months to uh, actually release. So, I mean, that's cool that, that it kind of got saved uh, and people will get to experience it. And I really like that script. That's what the thing that was sad is like, it's a good script and it just didn't work out. But that's as I mean, it's funny because, like I said, there there have been times um, where you get mired in it and you get a little... I don't know, you get a little down on it or it's just, you know, the 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 grueling part of it because it does take so long to do some of the stuff. And I know with my most recent movie, uh, Annihilate All Humans, which is like a flying saucer movie, there are a lot of special effects. Um, um, it just sometimes can be grueling and you get to it eventually, um, but you just got to fight through it. I'm curious how much overlap is there like in the production process? Are you actually, cause I noticed like uh looking on, on like you actually edit your film. So yeah. you're taking it from writer stage all the way down to the editing stage. Are you also, is there any, at any point like, okay, now you're editing, like you'll take part of your day to edit one while you're maybe writing another, or do you literally just go from start to finish on one and then do the whole thing all over again? I mean, sometimes there's overlap. Um, the perfect example, actually, is uh, one of the movies Billy Joe was in, Queen of Snakes. Um, we ended up shooting that concurrently with uh, Guns of the Apocalypse, which was kind of, that, that was a new experience. I ended up writing those two roughly about the same time, and I just started, decided I'm going to shoot them both. Um, so we'd shoot Guns of the Apocalypse on the weekend, and then during the week, we'd shoot Queen of Snakes. Uh, and then during the downtime, because I wanted to release Guns of the Apocalypse first, I would edit Guns of the Apocalypse. Although there was like a scene in Queen of Snakes that I edited right away because we shot it in a movie theater, and I had to make sure I had everything in case we needed to go shoot more at that movie theater. Um, so there sometimes is some overlap. Um, there's usually... Um, when I get to the end of the process and I'm done with one movie and I'm starting into the next one, there's usually like sort of post-production stuff, but even just like, um, like release preparations or post-release preparations, I'll be doing that stuff while also writing the new one. Um, there is some, but it's, it's usually in the middle of the, the process. It's just right on the one thing, but toward the edges of it, there tends to be some. And occasionally when I have downtime, if there's, a scheduling thing and like, I'm not going to be maybe scheduling, um, uh, you know, if, if there's a, a big gap, sometimes I'll, if I have downtime, I'll start writing something or I'll start messing with an idea for something else or whatever. So, I mean, there is some overlap, but not, not as much. It's just usually on the edges of the beginning and ends of things. 
other than the Queen of Snakes, Guns of the Apocalypse thing, that was the only time I've ever like shot two things at once, which was an interesting thing. It was really kind of cool because uh, I'd never had this before to like really not edit something until I had the entire thing shot. That was really weird to just be able to, in essence, edit the movie linearly from beginning to end. I Usually I'm sort of jumping around, right? Because everything's, we got to shoot this scene and then we'll shoot this scene and it's out of order. This time it was really weird to edit literally from beginning to end. And I thought it was kind of cool, actually, um, but it was a different experience. So I want to ask about your, um, you mentioned how you just kind of started doing this without really, you know, like, I want to make a movie, right? And then I yeah. want to try this and how every milestone has kind of been a revelation. Yeah. Was there Was there anything when you started that you didn't know how to do or that you kind of just had to learn as you went? Or was it kind of all of it? Uh, I think, well, so when I started, um, I had some, um, experience doing, um, at least, uh, playwriting, which I didn't like school, uh, and some, um, screenwriting and editing. Cause I had done some, um, I, I went to school originally for audio engineering and, uh, one of the, a couple of the classes I was, had to take involved like audio for video, but then also, um, you know, video and audio. I mean, they're hand in hand, right? Uh, and I, so I did some internships at like an old public access station back in the 90s. So I ended up helping out on a lot of productions, doing the back end stuff because I didn't really want to be on camera. And so I ended up getting some experience. So I had a big level of experience. Um, and being a musician uh, and recording music, there was a, there was some overlap there with um digital video editing and digital like um, music recording and sequencing and stuff, which I picked up over the years, um, the, the music part of it. And I realized that it was like I, I had sort of half of what I needed to know to start. And then I learned the other half while I did it. So I hadn't really done digital editing, but uh, video editing, but digital video editing isn't too far removed from digital audio editing. So I ended up you know, having sort of a leg up in that respect when I started uh, is having all this stuff that, um, again, I sort of had a, 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 a step ahead. Um, but the first few movies, I was making everything up as I go along. I mean, I didn't I didn't know how to, like, say, light a scene at night. Right. It was like, well, how do you shoot a movie in the forest at night? You know, how do you do that? So I just, I looked it all up on the internet. Seriously, I went nuts and just like took notes and did all this stuff. I think the one thing that I've, I've learned more over the years is how to effectively direct, right? Uh, early on, it was just kind of like I'd point the camera at people and be like, action, you know, and just let them sort of let actors sort of do whatever they wanted. Um, and then over the years, I've gotten to the point now where it's like, I find that a lot of actors still appreciate that if you're just like, I trust you to do it right. And if you're doing it right, I'm just not going to say anything, right? Because I want you to sort of feel the if it's working and I'm agreeing with you, I'm not going to get in the way of your process. But if it's not, then we'll talk. Or if I have something really specific in mind, I'll talk beforehand and be like, this is what I'm thinking. And then we'll try and work it out back and forth. And then we'll try. And if it's not working, okay, what do you think? You know, we'll try and do stuff. Uh, but then also little things like if an actor's like, what do you think of this? And I'm not quite sure. Well, like, let's do it both ways, right? It's the old trick. It's like, let's do your way. Let's do my way. And we'll figure it out in the editing room because in the end I can do pick whichever one I liked best. Um, right. But trying to be collaborative with it, you know? But yeah, directing was the thing I think that I've learned more on the job than anything else. Next to the... The outside stuff that comes, you know, beyond once you've made a movie, it's like, well, what happens once you release it? What happens? How do you market it? How do you get people to watch it? How do you, you know, how do you build a fan base and all these things like um, that's that's the sometimes stuff that I feel like a lot of um, newer or just indie filmmakers don't do. They don't try to do. They don't. I don't know. It's like. um from the beginning, I always looked at it, uh, I think, a little different than some people, where it's like, I just want to make a movie and show it in some theaters and get people to see it and then sell DVDs or whatever to people. Um, I didn't care if I did a lot of big film festivals or whatever. I mean, I've played in some film festivals, but to me, that was never the goal. It was always like, no, I just want to somehow find a way to be able to continue to do this without putting my family in debt. That was it. That was my goal. Mm -hmm. 
So I wanted to, okay, because you already, you've already uh, touched on the thing I want to get into next. Like, you've clearly got to have an audience for this because you've been right. doing it for 18 years and you don't, and most people aren't going to get that far unless you've kind of found somewhere, someone who's, who's going to bite when you throw it out there. Right. So tell us about like, how did you, how did you find that audience? Was some of it like, yeah, because I mean, this is, this is, is you know, doing like 1950s style B horror movies. I mean, I know you're going to get, you'll, there'll certainly be like that curiosity factor. Right. How do you cultivate that dedic a dedicated audience enough to where you can still be doing this like 18 years later? Well, it's funny. Um, the sort of history of it was was kind of interesting, just to touch on that briefly. You know, when we put out the first movie, like the people in the theater were like our friends and family. We like knew everybody in the theater, right? Um, and then like the second, third film, there was, I had a distribution deal with this local company at one point that didn't work out. And so like those that first, three movies like the first three first movie was friends and family the second two after that were were more um people that the distributor was sort of bringing in to try and um you know bulk up our like premieres and stuff to make it say hey we're doing this exciting thing throw money at us and then that fell apart and then by the fourth movie what was really interesting and i always tell this i always bring this up is that by the fourth film, we did a premiere, and we always do it at the same theater. I mean, consistency is one of those things, right? It's like the more you try to create traditions, too, that that helps a lot. Uh, because you, I do have, like, a handful of people who just every year, they throw 20 bucks at the production, and then they show up to the premiere, and it's a thing they do with their families. And now you, you got people who, like... Were kid like they were teenagers when they first saw the first one, and now they've like brought their kids to things. It's weird. It's it's starting to become this weird intergenerational thing. But um, that fourth movie, when we did that premiere, it was like one of the lower attended ones. But one of the coolest things about it was like I remember at the premiere turning to my wife and I just said, "Who are these people? I don't know like anybody here." And in the end, she's like, "I think you have fans." <laughs> I was like what what is happening because it was like it was suddenly people just word of mouth catching on that there was this local guy doing this you know fun goofy thing and my movies are they're just meant to be fun right they're just you go out and you sort of experience this retro style cinema which i love just that very i, I don't want to say unserious but it's it's just it's meant to be family friendly fun but not in the sort of modern sense. I think a lot of modern family friendly films tend to be just geared toward kids. It's like, no, 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 it's just safe for everyone because I'm doing this old style movie. But it's also people, I think, because I'm doing this particular genre, bring, bring their own sort of things to it. Like I, I have like a, a, a certain chunk of the fan base that are old enough to remember going to those movies when they were kids, right? So for them, it's a nostalgia. And you have people my age who grew up with it because of our parents who used to introduce us to them as kids. And then you have the sort of generation of kids who grew up with stuff like Mystery Science Theater 3000, who just love old movies and were introduced to it through that. And so they want to see sort of what I'm doing. And they're there to kind of not make fun of it, but just sort of like laugh at the things that I sort of put in there to like wink and nod toward like, yeah, technology has made this much easier and better, but look, it's a, you know, flying saucer made out of, you know, plates, you know, that kind of thing where it's like you end up with this weird subs sets of people who do it for certain things. Honestly, it was just patience and, and, uh, you know, perseverance of just year after year trying to keep it going. Um, and then, trying really hard to um engage with people um but not intrusively <laughs> like uh i do and have for since the beginning do like a monthly online newsletter right and just once a month i send out a newsletter uh and then it's expanded to adding like a little podcast where i just talk about what's going on and you know now i'm going through like the history of it all and then other Ad, added bonus of uh, there's this friend of mine named Steve Sullivan who writes this sort of retro styled um, uh, it's all fiction sort of based on the same thing and then we do a dramatic reading of it basically month after month and it becomes like a serial at the end of my podcast so I mean it's like building things that try to keep people coming back without being annoying about it 
Uh, well, but then, then like when people, but, sorry, go ahead. You also, you also, in addition, you travel a lot and you've gone yeah. to a lot of conventions, a lot yeah. of, uh, I don't, you've been to some Alamo draft houses and things, oh, yeah. right? Like things like mm -hmm. that. So you're constantly, I feel like putting it out there in different that, ways. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, it's like the marketing of it, right? It's like always trying to keep it try and find new audiences, but then also it's like you have to try and find new people while simultaneously, you know, feeding the people who already like it, but then also accepting the fact that nobody's going to certain people, you know, not everyone's going to like it forever. People come, they go. It's like, and you got to accept that, right? It's like, there's, there's big fans from the first eight years. And now I haven't heard from them in years. And then you have big fans who've been through the whole thing, right? Who year after year made it into like family traditions and, you know, when I have downtime, it's like I try to do conventions. I try to hit the people um, and, and and appeal to those folks who um, are a little more, you know, into fandoms. Right. Because, I mean, when I was I've been I've been like a big like Star Wars and Star Trek guy. And I've been to a lot of like Star Trek conventions and sci fi conventions. And I was like, you know, these folks are those folks are the best. Right. Um, and they're 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 passionate about things right so if you can find the types of folks who are passionate about these kinds of things they tend to be very sort of loyal to the brands or whatever that they're you know the properties they're into and i try to you know go to them you know where they are and do cool off the wall stuff like do cool um, conventions or do personal screenings where I go and, and try to make it more of an, more than just watching a movie, right? It's always like, how do you make it more of an experience? And that was the thing I did even with my premieres is like, and you've been to a couple of them, you know, it's, it's never just like, we're just going to watch a movie and do a Q and a, which is what I feel like every indie filmmaker does. They're like, we're going to show the movie. And then we're all going to stand up here and you can ask us questions. I don't even do that. It's like, I don't, if you want to ask me questions, come to my merch table and I'll answer your questions, but I also sell you on something. Right. Uh, but I try to do it up as more of a, an experience of you're going to the movies. It's a premiere. We're, we're doing it up. Um, we're getting dressed up. We're going to show, you know, retro stuff to sort of set the mood. We're going to show the movie. We're going to, we do like silent auctions and it's just to try to make it into more of a, a party, I guess. <laughs> so what it, what it seems to me like is, because you mentioned this with like the whole Partridge family thing, is it, you have it as a family affair because of your family, but then, and I feel this as an actor who's part of the Mimmerverse, is that it becomes this giant family. You, It's a, the audience, the, the, the fandom, the actors, everybody has a sense of belonging to this thing that you've created right uh, and i would we agree with that I mean, yeah and i think that's 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 one of the things that i think i tried to foster early on was just this idea of it being more of a a really big local theater troupe more than anything else right um where it's like we're all we're all a community theater right so you're gonna go to see a play with this community theater that might be your neighbors right and you're like i'm gonna go see the neighbor in our town or whatever you know it's like that kind of thing of just like trying to foster a community around it and that's one of those things i'm always you know like I mentioned, uh, you know, like Star Trek is a good example of this, is that Star Trek fans all tend to look at the show and then the conventions and all these things as more than just a show. It becomes a community. It really does, especially with those conventions where it's like you get to go hang out with like minded folks and you may not have much in common, but you can at least discuss who's the better captain or whatever. Right. And it's so it's so that idea um, that I, I've been trying to foster over the years is of you know, we may not have a lot in common. Uh, we may not see, see things the same, but we can at least enjoy cheesy monster movies together and hang out. And, and you know, the, people are friendly and they want to be part of things. And uh, I, I just I like that idea of sort of creating just a fun, you know, safe community for everybody to come hang out and enjoy cheesy monster movies. And then, you know, just be I don't know. Just uh, it's an escape to a certain extent. And I, I, I like that. And I've I figured if I did this long enough and did enough of this, I, I didn't see how 
it, it, it wouldn't kind of turn into that, you know I mean? And, and it kind of, it kind of feeds itself too, where it's like the more people do treat it like that more community, the more I want to do it even. And so it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy to a certain extent, if that makes sense. I was so excited that the movies got put on Amazon because it meant that yeah. I could be like, hey, my movie, The Giant Spider and Queen of Snakes are on Amazon. Go look at them. And um, so, yeah, I'm just curious if if that helped, because obviously when you go on those sites and you're looking at movies, it'll suggest other movies like it. So if you're looking right. at something like MSD3K, all of a sudden you're like, oh, you might also like these. And then you might discover you know, I've discovered like whole subgenres of right, horror right. films and monster movies. And I'm like, Ooh, I'm going to watch all these now. Right. Exactly. Well, it's funny. Um, really early on, um, you know, all, I mean, 2006, all I was, it was wanted to do was release a DVD. Cause to me, that felt like if I'm put a movie on DVD, it's a real movie. Um, and I started at the time looking into, um, I started, you know, buying movies and, and like music and stuff and realizing that the, the Amazon algorithm in particular was really useful, right? It was like, if you like this band, you might like these guys. If you like this movie, you might like this movie, like you just said, right? And early on, I said, you know what? If I can get my movie on on uh, Amazon, given enough time, I bet you it'll start working for me with the the algorithm. So for the first like three years, I you had to you have to pay like forty bucks a month to have, be able to add to you know add titles to Amazon. I for like three years run ran that at a loss, where it's like I'm not going to make enough money to make it worth it. But I know, given enough time, I can get into the algorithm, and eventually, when I have enough money or not enough movies, maybe I can start at least breaking even. And so I purposely, very early on, tried to put movies on Amazon. Um, and make them available so that eventually the algorithm would work for me. And that paid off. That actually ended up working uh, until uh, Amazon started messing with things and making it so they get all the money and you get nothing. I mean, it's 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 funny. It's like every time I feel like I'm on the cusp of actually being able to make a living doing this, it's taken away. <laughs> it just seems like every time you find something, it's like, this is going to be great. Then it falls, falls apart because the I think the companies get – word of it right and they're like hey you know if we we can charge these guys whatever we want if we charge them more and give them less what are, where else are they gonna go and it helps i mean to answer your question i mean i have a roku channel that's specific just to my movies um a bunch of them are on amazon and i still sell them on physical media because for all the people out there who don't want physical media, because there's still a lot of old folks, uh, old folks like myself, who still really want physical media and like collectors and stuff that want that stuff. Because, you know, in the age of streaming, you know, the, you can just the, the companies can just pull stuff off and it's gone. Yep. So I always like owning it because then, well, it may be gone on that streaming service, but I can just pull up my Blu-ray and watch it. Um, so over time, all these places of you know, sort of direct consumer going to events and trying to sell people on like, hey, check out a few of my movies, uh, doing screenings, doing events, um, putting stuff on Amazon, putting stuff on Roku. That has helped build the audience a lot. Um, just slowly trying to build. I think the the sort of length of time that I've been doing it has really helped in sort of building that audience. Um, but it's always sort of up and down because technology changes things. Um it used to be all physical media sales and then it became streaming and then streaming almost looked like it was going to be good. And then now we're back to sort of the idea of gatekeepers of, you know, Oh, well we, we say whether or not you're on, you know, on Amazon because Amazon used to be really nice to like indie filmmakers and now they are not They're They kind of suck, <laughs> but it's definitely helped build the audience quite a bit um, where you find like, more often than not, I'll, I'll get a, like a message from someone who's like, so I saw your movie as a suggestion because I watched like Mystery Science Theater 3000 and I loved your movie and I, I decided to go check it out. I found your website and I just bought them all. I just want to let you know. And they'd like buy them all, like an entire set of DVDs. Uh, and then they become big fans. And that's happened more than, you know, several times. Um, but again, it's that constant like you, you have to be a salesman, right? You have to always constantly be like trying to get people to buy your stuff or at least check it out. Um, 
And I sometimes think that, um, I don't know, some folks, they don't, they don't do that. They don't, you know, make that a priority, um, or they hope sort of someone else will do it for them, <laughs> but that, yeah. you know, that doesn't often happen. I mean, you're going to be your best salesman for your own work. I mean, that's, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. But I mean, that's something I've noticed with a lot of creatives, like they, they get very daunted or even put off by having to, you know, do the salesman thing or they have this or some, or you occasionally get something like I'm, I'm too good for it. Why, you know, but I always, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, You get those types, you know, but I'm always like, well, if you're not willing to hype your own work, why should anybody else? But at the same time, it's something that it's, it's it's definitely like a real struggle because I've, I've seen it put people off where they make a thing or they're doing something and then just, it's like, why aren't you on social media like every yeah. day hyping this? Because I've seen people who've got really good stuff too, and you they don't, you know, they're. I'm like, man, if I had that, believe me, it, you'd have like four or five posts a day, me telling you all about it. Well, and I think that's you know, um, the the sort of the, that also goes in hand in hand with the the sort of building the community of like. One of the things I try to do often is I try to like engage people in not just the, hey, buy my stuff, right, or check out my stuff, but like getting them involved in the like minutia of the movies themselves of like, hey, which character you think would be best suited to do this or which character you think would do, you know, trying to like build the, I don't know, that personal connection between the the fans and the the characters in the thing and again i think that goes back to the sort of sci-fi convention thing of you know if you ever go to one of those and you talk to people you can get into some really really like you know conversations about the 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 littlest points of minutia about well i don't think that character would react that way well i think they do and here's why and you know people get really into it so i try to foster that um but yeah i i think for me going back to being that i used to be in a lot of um like bands when I was a teenager, like it seemed like, um, I was never above like me and my friends. It was part of the thing was like, you want people to come see your band. So you go out and you, you hand out flyers at shows. You, you make the connection, like come see my band, come see my band. Uh, you know, doing even at school, just like passing out. We always did like, uh, parties in my parents' basement. They were so nice. I can't believe it. When I look back, I would never let my kids throw the kinds of parties we threw. My parents were cool. They were just like, yeah, you guys can play here or whatever. We'll sit outside and make sure it doesn't get out of hand. Uh, but, you know, you go around and you're always kind of selling this idea of like, hey, check out my band. Come, we're throwing a party. It'll be fun. And I think some of that just came into the movie part, too, of you got to sell it. I mean, uh, even if even if it's just trying to sell it to like distributors or aggregators or whatever, where you're just like, no, I'm trying to rep my movie to get people to see it. You have to do it um, because no one's going to be as excited about it as you are uh, unless you're, you know, someone awesome um, and you're a well-known name. You don't have to do that. You hire people to do that. But if you're kind of a nobody who's just trying to make your way, you got to do it or at least find people that are going to do it. But even then it's, it's part of it. It's, it's the whole, the whole, it's not just making the movie or making, you know, whatever you have to then, okay, you made a movie. Now what? Well, you got to get people to see it and you got to get people reason to want to see it. And then you got to make sure that if they enjoy it, maybe they buy it or they find out where they can do it so they can pass it on. And you got to like, in the age of social media, it seems like, you know, um, promoting things is a million times easier than it used to be. So, why aren't you? It's not that much, you know, and uh, sometimes these folks spend so much time on social media anyway. It's like just throwing a little like a uh, salesman ship right there. Come on, you can do it. It is and it isn't, right? It, it's easier, but there's also so much more noise out there. So like that is in, marketing, true. in marketing, they'll say, you know, marketing starts with having with the product, right? You have to have a good product. And for you, I think like what what appeals to people, especially with the whole community building and whatever, is that your movies, and I didn't get to mention this before, like, because Brandon, you haven't seen any of them yet, have you? Any of them? No, I've watched a lot of the trailers. Unfortunately, I haven't okay. seen any of the movies. Yeah, I didn't know, I know they were on Amazon until you, you said so. You should have. <laughs> well, also, you should have told I have that Roku channel that you can check out, oh, so I highly recommend that. So. I know. I would have but, loved to have watched these coming in because it was like, I didn't know. I, I just thought. I had to get the, the DVDs and I was just like, yeah, oh, okay. well, okay. 
That's okay. My my point though is just that once you start watching them, what Christopher has like built into these movies is, you know, not only do you have this whole family of this 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 theater troupe of people, right, that are back repeatedly, but like also like you you know, one movie is set in this time period and then so this character is actually this character's mother over here and so this like yeah. that's why the Mimiverse, right? Because it's this whole universe mm -hmm. of connected stories that are just connected by these little Easter egg tethers. Right. So if you're one of those people, you know, yeah, you catch the little things, right? Where it's like, yeah, it's little parts where it's like, it's not necessarily blatant in your face. I'm not going to hit you over the head with it of just like, you have to see this movie to understand this movie, but it's just little things that I'll try and throw in to connect like your character to another character. And if you pay attention, yeah, you're like, oh, wait, that's the daughter of this. Guy. Oh, okay. Or, Forensic or fandom like is the, the term. <laughs> there it is. Or right. Like the flashlight moment which yeah little things like that movies. so like there will be little little winks that like if you're if you've seen a few then all of a sudden you're like oh i've seen that before where did i say oh it was in that like so you're you're rewarding people for watching more you're right well and and it's funny because the flashlight thing is just this stupid thing i did in the first movie where whenever someone turned on a flashlight they turn it on into their face turn it off turn on another face again and then go about their business. I don't know why I, I thought that was funny uh, when I first did it. And I was just like, okay. And I told all the actors, you have to do it this way. And they're like, all right. And so I started carrying that from movie to movie. And now it's become just like, there's a handful of things that I try to put in every movie somewhere. Um, that again, it rewards the people that have seen multiple films or have stuck with it for a while. And it's always funny at like the premieres because you have, you always have sort of a, a mix of people. You have the actors, you have the, you know, their friends and family, you have random people who are just checking out for the first time. And then you have the hardcore fans and like that moment comes up and the hardcore fans will like cheer and laugh. And you, you see it on the faces of other, like, why is that? What? Why is that? Okay. I don't get it. Um, but that's, that's the thing you sort of reward insider status, right? Of like, Hey, you're part of the, you're part of the crowd. You get it. Um, if you know, the, you know. Yeah, it's the shared universe thing, which I totally did two two years before Marvel did. I, they they ripped me off because uh, you know Iron Man came out in two thousand eight, and Monster Phantom Lake came out in two thousand six. So I I beat them by two years, uh, and that was never. I mean, at the beginning, that wasn't the intention to do this sort of you know eighteen nineteen movie you know shared universe. It was just that I made the first movie. The original intention was I made the first movie just because I wanted to make a movie and say I made a movie finally. That was it. I wanted to make a movie, show it in a theater, and see my name on the big screen. That was all I wanted to do. And then it was like I had such a cool experience and loved every second of it. I'm like, let's make another one. But I'm, let's let's do like a sequel, but not a sequel. It'll be like we'll take a couple of the characters from that one and we'll put them in a new adventure so that in essence it's a sequel, but it's not. So it's just a further adventure so you don't have to see either one to understand them. And after that... You know, I was like, well, the second one went well, let's do another one. And then it just kind of snowballed from there and became a thing. Um, it wasn't my original intention, but I've 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 wrote it hard since. OK, I have to ask, since this is a shared universe, because I've had I've got a little experience with this myself, not as much as you. But is there like a place where you have this all graphed out, like even if it's just for your own personal use, so you know where where Honestly, and when everything is or is it just all in your head? It's all in my head, but I've gotten to the point now where I've started to realize that maybe I do need to map it out just because it's like it's gotten pretty crazy. And I know like there have been points where even my kids are like they'll read a script because they're they're my first whenever I finish the script, I give it to them and I want I want to see their reactions to it. Uh, and they, you know, they're not they're not forgiving. You know, they're not, they're not just like, Oh dad, this is great. They're like, I don't know about this. I don't understand this. You know, they're really honest because I want them to be, and I bug them. I'm like, no, be, be honest. Cause you're just helping make it better. Um, and I know like in one, one of my scripts recently, like my daughter's like, I thought she like, they were like related I'm like, oh crap, you're right. And so I had to go back and make changes because I was like, I was like, I probably should start writing this stuff down because it's starting to get lost. There are too many, there are too, it's too much at this point. Um, because it, it used to be really minor stuff, but now it's 
it's starting to get jumbled and I'm just maybe getting older too, but also it's becoming too much information. And I think enough time, some of that earlier stuff is starting to get lost just cause I'm, I've forgotten some of that crap cause I haven't touched it in, you know, 15 years and, and you move on. Um, but then it comes back and I, Oh yeah, that I forgot that. And then I have to go back and make changes. And then you have I mean, a Luke Leia moment, right? <laughs> yeah. Nothing like that yet. Um, <laughs> That's fashionable at this point, these I, days. Yeah, at this point, I'd, I'd do it just to be funny, I guess. But yeah, I haven't done anything that bad. But there are definitely times where I know I've forgotten stuff. But also, I made a point. Um, it was in 20, uh, 2017. I, I, you know, it, it gotten to the point where like some of the characters I wanted to reuse, like I, the actors aren't around anymore and they're not able to do it. And I still wanted to use this character. So I did actually a movie called demon with the atomic brain. That's about like reality getting kind of cut up into little pieces. And then they have to like put it back together. Um, and in the end it's implied that it, it they didn't do it perfectly. So there's changes now. So mm -hmm. that now when like, uh, like I, put like this character in another movie i'm like oh yeah it's a different actor but that's just because of the whole demon with the atomic brain thing it just kind of mixed things up and then i like did like um like a tip of the hat to it where like one of the characters is like you look different and he's like oh new haircut and he's like that's it and i just cut it at that so it's like we're acknowledging the fact that it's a different actor but it's really it's the demon with the atomic brain thing that just mixed everything up a little bit like marvel yeah. the uh the multiverse yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's what it what kind of came down to. Also, going uh, just back to say bewitched, you know, like if they can change out the husband halfway through the series, yeah, right? Who cares? Well, and that's that's it. I mean, it's like, does it does it really matter? I mean, in the end, it's like there's still that you know suspension of disbelief, but at the same time, it's like, well, uh, you can't do it because maybe the actor hit puberty or something and is no longer a kid. You know, it's like you're just going to have to recast it or just not use it. Or if you want to use a character, just recast it. And actually what ended up happening is we did that that musical, the stage musical, the Monster Phantom Lake, the musical. And one of the characters from the Monster Phantom Lake was played by a certain actor, but in the musical it was played by a different actor. So what I made is when I brought that character back into the movies, I used the actor from the musical. So it, it still it still kind of works. <laughs> All confusing. It's like it's so like confusing. a little bit like uh yeah, a little bit like the Spider Verse and a little bit like also I, I do agree you need a chart because the Mimiverse is kind of becoming like Iceland. You gotta check and make sure someone's not your cousin before anything happens. Right. I mean it's getting to that point. It really is. Or or just living in a small town in the south. <laughs> i'm not well, lying man when I, I grew up i realized like by the time and then i did thankfully I, I didn't date a lot in my in high school but then i realized like how many people i was probably related to because my family <laughs> had been in the same area for like a hundred and you know 50 years well so. that's that weird thing with my last name like i said there's not that many people with my last name so if you meet one you're related just stay away from them you know it's like no 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 you're related enough just stay away um you know, it's funny, like, uh, I just thought of an instance of where this happened, where um, we were using a character. You you talked about how sometimes I'll have, like, uh, like uh, say, like, a younger version of a character, and then, like, their daughter, or, like, even, like, a different actor playing them older. And I've done that a few times. Um, there was a, a, a script I read, you know, the movie I did l the year before, um, there was a moment where, like, one of my kids pointed out, I was like, well, this doesn't work because according to this like an earlier movie they like go and like leave the planet and go on like a space mission so if you do it this way it doesn't work because then like you forgot about how the fact that they leave and i'm like crap i did forget that they yeah the timeline no longer works and so i have to go in and like you know redo it and try to make it work so it does get confusing i i admit i probably did Okay, I admit it. I definitely need to write it down and just make a make a timeline of everything and figure out the connections because it's gotten crazy. All you have to do is introduce time travel. And then Well, that's I mean, like I said, I I, I did the I sort of multiverse thing where everything got mixed up and so all the all the continuity errors at this point were because of that. <laughs> everything was great up to that point. Now it's all remixed. Because that was the thing with the first two movies is, like I said, I took some characters from the first movie and made another movie. But in the first movie, the one character meets these two characters and then like one of them dies. 
And then in the next carrot movie, they're meeting each other again, and they're both like the one guy's alive again. So it's like, well, how's that possible? And I'm like, I don't know. It's a conspiracy. Well, I can't tell you. Yeah, I have a I have a wish. I want to I want to put out. Can I just manifest something for a second here? Do it. Do it. I have a wish. So first of all, I need uh, I need worlds to collide. I'm obsessed with this whole like world builder idea, and. I met Brandon because he was doing this podcast called Garfield's Crossing, um, which I'm a part of and I'm multiple people in. So that I'm one, you know, one world there. And one of the stories that I'm a part of in that takes place in an old movie theater. And I have this dream that there will be a Garfield's Crossing episode where there's a Mimiverse film playing in the movie theater. Oh, I mean, I'm cool. Man, I'm... I wish you had it. Can we I make wish sure you'd introduce like, that sooner? Can we make sure it's like I, your movie playing? Like, so it's like you on screen. Sure. I mean, that's I'm sure. Old, sure. Yeah. Well, so, because done... like I'm the daughter of the movie theater owner in that. So, like, if that you know happens, and then and I I'm, also and I'm just, the father. So, <laughs> yeah, I love it. So then I also just want to cross pollinate all these worlds because I need you to meet Jeff Adams, who does Icebox Radio, because his stuff is all anthology stuff too you know, mainly, and it's kind of inspired by the same sorts of things. And he is also insanely prolific. I think like 13 years he's been making all these podcasts and he has a podcast about his podcast, just <laughs> kind of the same vein. Yeah. Um, and he travels and does stuff for it. And then I also need to somehow get in um, uh, who we haven't interviewed yet, but we're going to uh, my friend uh, Brain Brain just went I'm sorry. Names just go out and he's going to hear this and I'm going to be like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Todd Faulkner. I'm just saying, what is it about Minnesota? Like, it's like you, Jeff Adams and Prince just cranking it out. Like, well, I, you know, know, it's, cold. It's, it's cold. What else are you going to do in the winter? I mean, that's cold. what it comes down to. Like, you need something to keep your mind off the existential dread of, of the constant gray, you know, like you can't even go outside. It hurts to go outside. I mean, it's just that cold air and you're just like, what am I going to do? <laughs> Uh, cowering in my basement, trying to stay warm. Yeah, it's like, ooh, I can write scripts. Right. And that's what and it so, is. So I, need, so I have all of my, my Minnesotan people, my Georgia one, and then Todd Faulkner and his wife who have their podcast on Canning County, which, Christopher, if you haven't listened to it, you really should. It's amazing. Okay. But it's also, okay. it's also like cheeky fun, and it's also... Um, uh just it's amazing it's really well done it's very funny and it is uh sort of sci-fi inspired small town they say they like to say it's like the coen brothers meets um twilight zone i mean i'm sold with that um i love the yeah. coen brothers i love twilight zone so i'm in so you gotta send me links yeah. to all this stuff so i make sure that i can check all this stuff out yeah well, so i funny. want all these worlds to come together that's my I, wish. And I'm, I'm, yeah, the Garfield's Crossing thing is super easy. I can, I mean, if if we get to keep going with it, unfortunately, what what's already out there, I mean, there's two stories that we have artwork for that we have to write. Unfortunately, one of them is through my partner Clayton, who is kind of not doing a lot of you know creative work anymore. He's got his own business off to the side. It, it takes up all of his time. But another one that I can write. And then we want, I want to do like what we call like little vignettes, or like these little shorts. And one of them I did want to do about like, cause like we, we created this in, uh, in Garfield's crossing. We have this whole, uh, one of the main landmarks is a theater. So, and we've done two, two separate stories about it. Um, one is in 1979 where you see the theater actually get its name. And the other one is in present day, I think like 2018, where now it's it's become you know something else, and you're you get to see the current owner, you know, um, who's got a bit of a shady past, and we're making a very specific reference to a movie in that. Um, but like, so yeah, if we got to do more, I I would love to do. I mean, that's one of the things. Is part of how how that came about is because one of our writers um, is a guy named James David Patrick, who's like a cr just crazy movie buff, like he. He can just get like super deep with uh like movie knowledge. He has like a group of people online that he goes to the uh you know up until the pandemic was going to the TCM Film Festival every year, 
and like they all have like blogs and podcasts and everything and like it's just like a repository of old school film knowledge and now most of them are not or like 40 and under so and and that was kind of like part of me pushing him to kind of write something it's like dude you could you could like a, we're gonna make a thing and it's gonna be like a theater and this is your story this is your thing and part of the thing we did in the in the story is that the character i play who is uh the father of billy's character he likes to show like um foreign and art films to these small town folk in north georgia <laughs> so it's just like this guy who is like and you just kind of just have to admire him just for his weirdness because he <laughs> wants to just be like I'm going to show like, uh, you know, was it a uh, Casanova by Fellini <laughs> and up, up here in like this tiny corner of Northwest Georgia, where, you know, there's probably barely a thousand people living there. If that, well, they're, they're well versed in cinema, at least. <laughs> Brandon, I wish I could take you to uh, Northern Minnesota. And I, I stayed at one point with my old producer, Rebecca in this town called Fergus Falls. And it, it's like, it's like that town. I mean, she, she ran the theater there and the theater, the day I showed up was showing, she was showing some uh, documentary about the Iraq war <laughs> to this small town in Minnesota in and on, all the, places. on the anniversary of nine 11, like showing this documentary that was like an anti-war film. And then she wow. uh, like, she was always, she's so artsy and the whole community of Fergus Falls, like they're very, it's very Lutheran and it's very, it's very nice and but it is it's, so it's very religious community but they're also very artsy and they support the arts a lot which hmm. you know i feel Who like it's, I, I would love for you to see that town because it kind of feels like that yeah i don't know it's uh yeah it's uh I, i'd love to do it's one of the things that i'd love to do more with it and hell but I'd, I'd i'd even invite chris to come write for it but at this point i think we're just uh it's it's kind of on in <laughs> It's kind of in hibernation. We, it, I, I'm trying to finish out some other projects right now to uh, get back to it. But um, yeah, well, that'd be a uh, a full voice cast. You know, um, I'm, I'm all there's... for I'm all for crossovers and and you know, I mean, that's another thing is you know, uh, uh, just just you know, meeting up with other people. You know, it's like that sort of that you know, building community within you know, filmmaker circles and, and other creatives of just trying to like, how do you support each other? Right. Like I mentioned, um, my friend, Steve Sullivan, he's a writer, he's been doing lots of stuff and he started doing this thing called atomic tales specifically. Um, his intention is to, it's like these short stories that are all kind of connected that involve, you know, giant monsters and, and it takes place in like a sort of 50, 60s. Um, and, you know, he, he gives, gives them to me and we do like this dramatic reading of them. Uh, and then like in my latest movie I just put out, like I, I directly referenced the sort of idea of what he was doing of just like, hey, um, you know, there's this this character in there called Agent 7. And I just put them in the movie just as not really like a full on just like, hey, it's from Atomic Tales. But if you know, you know, it's those little things, you know. Uh, but yeah. oh, I can I can add another thing into the mix because uh, I I got another uh, man. inside inside man here. I got uh, mm -hmm. with I have a uh, um a, a guy I've come to know and I've actually been on the podcast and I'm actually helping produce the upcoming mm -hmm. season. Um, it's a uh, it started out being called Mandible Judy. It's um kind of like a an eighties like Stephen King style horror movie. Oh, not horror movie, like like a horror podcast, but in the vein of like Steve old, like the old eighty Stephen King movies, and then it then it evolves into like a spinoff called Under Dead Water, which is where I came in, and like part of it takes place between nineteen, like in the nineteen eighties, and then other parts like the eight, like a whaleboat on the eighteen sixties. That's a jump, all right. And, yeah, and it's and it's it's cool how they kind of because you realize it's all interconnected, and it it's this really wild like super imaginative thing uh, done by a guy named Chris Burke, who's actually one of the guys that helped score the toxic Avenger. Oh, cool. Yeah. Super cool guy. And um, he, he's Amazing working on musician. season three. Oh yeah. Yeah. Phenomenal musician. Great sound designer, like super cool guy to talk to. Um, he'd probably love your stuff. Um, 
feel free to but, pass um, it along. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I'll, I'll send you the link <laughs> to his thing as well. Key, right. Just tell him, just like, Hey, check this out. Have this, just this mega crossover between, you know, the, the, the Judy verse and, uh, the Mimiverse and the Garfield's crossing and you know, whoever, we'll, just, we'll, just, well, just like, just, uh, you know, this mega cross pollination event. You know, I'm going to say yes. uh, real quick that just for some reason you talked about, uh, you know, he, he was involved with the toxic Avenger and it made me think of, uh, this story, uh, that's one of my favorite things from the movie, the giant spider, which Billy Joe was in. Um, there's a moment in the movie, um, and this is this sort of like, you know, when you find out that like random people, you know, are connected to other things and, and you're like, wait, what? The universe said that um, we're doing. There's a scene in the movie where the giant spider attacks a drive in and we shot it at two different drive ins in um, Wisconsin. One, we did the sort of exteriors of the drive in because they uh, had this great marquee and, you know, it just it worked out. And then we did the interior at a different drive in. Well, the interior stuff, we were shooting at this drive in in Shatek, Wisconsin, uh, called the Stardust. And um, while we were shooting it or while we were getting set up to shoot it, um, the, the the crew was out there sort of like placing cars to be perfect in the lot. And the lot, the drive in owner said you know for all the extras and the, the classic car owners uh we're giving you know we're gonna feed you all just give you you know hot dogs and baked beans and chips uh so you're you know since this is taking a while and we want to be you know feed you guys and it was super nice of them to do it so because of my crew was out doing stuff mitch gonzalez the monster guy and i had sort of a little bit of downtime and I was like, now's probably the chance if we go eat, since we're going to be busy for the rest of the day, let's just go eat uh, now uh, so we're not you know, dying later. And so we get in and we're standing in line um, and like a guy taps me on the shoulder and it's this old, older, grizzled looking guy. Like he just, he looks, he looks like he'd eat you for breakfast. Uh, and he's like, hey, have you ever heard of the movie The Giant Spider Invasion? I'm like, yeah, it's like a classic uh, like bad seventies giant spider movie. Uh, and it was shot in Beloit, Wisconsin. Right. Uh, and the, the claim to fame is that it was on mystery science series 3000. Basically everyone ignored it until then, but it's one of the best episodes of mystery science series 3000. And the big thing about the movie is that their giant spider is like a giant rebar structure on a, on a VW bug. That's their giant spider. Um, so he tasks me, he's like, yeah, have you ever heard of them? I'm like, oh, yeah, of course we have, Mitch. Of course we've heard of that. And he goes, well, I was in that movie. I was like, wait, what? He's like, yeah, well, I was I was in that movie. I was, well, I was in this one scene, and I was like, that's the coolest thing ever. He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, I'm so happy you're here. You get to be in my movie. He's like, I don't want to be in your movie. I'm like, why are you here? He's like, no, I just want my truck in your movie. And I'm like, well, your truck doesn't go in my movie unless you're sitting in it. He's like. All right. And I was like, the only reason, he's like, I'm like, the only reason why you absolutely have to be in it, because you're the only human being on the planet who can say I've been in two different giant spider movies shot in Wisconsin. Only person in the history of the world. He's like, all right, fine. And he was so just funny. grizzled and so funny. I just wow. I loved it. That's my favorite. Um, and so you see it. He's just sitting there in his truck. It's a beautiful old Ford truck. And he's just sitting in there. And I get a shot of him sitting in there. And he just looks angry. I love it. <laughs> awesome. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's I like those it. little stories. That's the best. That's my favorite part about all the years of doing it. So the little weird things that have happened. Like when you were in the giant spider, somehow we ended up getting on this thing about your neck and being like a neck model or something. I don't know why or how I'm... that started, but it became a thing where it was like, cause I was just trying to get that insert shot of you, like holding a walkie talkie and like, we got your neck in there and someone made some joke about your neck being your, your, your I'm pretty sure it's hater. probably Mark Hader. Yes. Uh, just started making jokes about your neck and that became a thing. It was like uh, Billy Joe Cohn's neck and model. Until now, I did not remember that, but now I do remember that, and I don't remember why, but I do remember it was when we were at the school, I believe. Yeah, it became and, like this thing. Um, there's a shot yeah, in the because tent. I was, a... Sorry, sorry, go ahead. I, I, well, I was going to say, I was more preoccupied with my glasses because like, I was like, oh crap, I forgot, I had to have, okay, the glasses that I was wearing were 1950s glasses for real, and they still had glass in them, and so I couldn't see with them on or without them on but it was more painful to have my contacts in and have them on so i was just like glasses less 
and like I kept forgetting to put the damn glasses on. So there's a couple shots where I just am not wearing them, even though I should be wearing them because I was wearing. And they were like they were like a thick prescription too, right? Like they they hurt to yeah. wear because they were just uh, oh. like you'd have to just take them off Absolutely. as soon as possible. Well, no, yeah. I remember so, cause so I was more preoccupied by that, <laughs> like just the, the neck, neck model thing. And actually, there is. Um, there is a shot I ended up using in the final one where we were, you're in like the tent and you have like the walkie talkie. And like, if you, I use it because it's like a picture looking down, it's like a shot looking down at the walkie talkie and you see like you and you see you go like this, like extra <laughs> neck. And it just made me laugh so much. I'm like, I have to use that shot. Cause you're like, you just see your, just a little extra of like, look at my neck. Cause it became this dumb thing. And that's, that's my favorite part about, about the shooting process is that sort of, see, you're a professional, um, a professional neck model. Uh, I, I, I love that in the shooting process of the, the sort of like creating things together with, with people that, you know, other creative people and you're just having a good time and, you know, out there trying to do this thing and, and, you know, create this work of art that, uh, you know, everyone's sort of on board. There's nothing, nothing compares to that of when everyone's just on the same page and you're there, you know, you're really vibing and, you know, as the kids say, getting things together and, and it's, it's my favorite thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you're the best neck are... model I've ever had in any movie. I'll just say it. Like Thank no you. one Thank holds you. a candle to your <laughs> neck. Thank you so much. Head and shoulders above the rest. Head and shoulders uh, above the rest. You could just you well, could just you know, sell pictures of your neck and just sign them. <laughs> Honestly, after this, I somewhere out, somewhere out there, there's there's someone with like a probably a very shady website for that. But I'm I mean, sure. I'm, not gonna, I'm saying at, after I'm this point, advocate. after this this episode comes out and some of the fans listen to it, they they <laughs> may end up just being like, "I want that that signed neck photo." So, so. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's got Teddy Teddy to the rescue. He's that, neck, me. Uh, that neck ain't free. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> well christopher thank you so much for coming on our show i would ask you where to find you i mean if you want to say it again you can be because you've already said it at the beginning but you, you always um, have to put it in there first chance you get check me out at say euphoria.com or the giant spider.com which is the easiest um, way to remember also, also you should you know tell people they can come check out your curling team Yes, uh, um, I'm taking a little break this year from the team. Um, some of the kids are, are filling in for me, um, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, we started getting into curling years ago, and now it's this weird thing that's part of the Mimoverse as well. It even shows up in the next movie. It's just like <laughs> all right. You're gonna have know. to explain that one to me because that's that's one that's one sport that's just utterly lost on me. We'll we'll do it like after the recording. Yeah, okay, but, okay, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we, we yeah, yeah. That, that's another. That's a whole Podcast different discussion. Entirely. There really is. Um, in fact, my uh, sorry, I just I, had to throw it in there. <laughs> well, and I got to brag because, like, my uh, my my daughter, my fifteen year old daughter, is actually in like a month um, going to the youth Olympic trials for curling. Like, she's trying to do the youth Olympic thing. She's that good. So, I mean, it's become a thing in my family. It's like movies and curling. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how, but it Wait, just became so a thing. Which daughter? Alice. Oh, Alice is. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. She's fifteen now, and she started curling a couple of years ago, and she, she's very good at it. So now she's uh, full on trying, like doing the trials in September. So, wow. yeah, well, that'll be crazy. To her. Yeah. That's amazing, and and thank you so much for coming and talking to us. It's been awesome. Thanks, yeah. um, yes. and I'm sorry I brought up the neck thing. I, I you, you try obviously you tried to to squash that over the years, and now you're like, dang it, it's out there again. It, it's just because she's humble. That's you know? right. She, she doesn't, doesn't want. She doesn't want to rub it into the rest of us who don't have fabulous necks. Exactly. She was yeah. like, you know, I just she's didn't not wanna... trying to make us feel less than. Yes, because um, I I have no neck. Me, it's just like you know, it's it's just shoulders. That's why I got the head. beard, man. Yeah, man. It's to hide the lack of chin. For me, it's like lips, neck. I mean, there's just. It's just not, it's not luscious and perfect. And you know, like yeah, the, the struggle is real. The struggle is real. This really went off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> Thanks, man. 
That will be all for this episode. To keep up with the show, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Scratch Claw Push. If social media isn't your thing, you can contact us at scratchclawpush at gmail.com. This podcast has been a Carcutta Media production. For a full list of our podcasts, go to carcuttamedia.com slash podcasts. This recording or any portion thereof may not be reproduced or used in any manner whatsoever without the express written permission of the publisher, except for use of brief quotations and review. Copyright 2023 by Carcutta Media, LLC. All rights reserved.